Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Bright Lights Online, conversations with our 2021 Humanities Awards winners. I'm Erin Greenwald, Vice President of Public Programs at the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities and Editor-in-Chief of 64 Parishes Magazine. Since 1985, the LEH Humanities Awards have honored the culture bearers, humanists, photographers, folklorists, and more who provide access to and interpret Louisiana history and culture. We are proud to share their stories and explore their contributions. In today's Bright Lights Online conversation, we'll reflect on the life and legacy of this year's posthumous Lifetime Contributions to the Humanities awardee, Frank DeCaro. The Lifetime Contributions Award recognizes those who have supported and been involved in public appreciation of issues central to the humanities. Frank was a nationally renowned folklorist who was particularly active in Louisiana, serving as first chairman and past president of the Louisiana Folklore Society. His last book, Downtown Mardi Gras, New Carnival Practices in Post-Katrina New Orleans, co-authored with Leslie Wade and today's moderator, Robin Roberts, was released in 2019, shortly before his passing in the spring of 2020 of COVID-19. Today's conversation is being recorded and streamed via Facebook Live using Zoom webinar. If you have a question you'd like answered during the question and answer period, please locate the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and type your question there. We've reserved about 15 minutes at the end of the conversation for your questions. We've also enabled closed captioning for today's program. To activate closed captions on your device, locate the closed caption icon marked CC in your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of the screen. Click it and select show subtitles. We are joined today by friends, colleagues, and admirers of Frank DeCaro, and I'm pleased to welcome our panelists. Barry Jean Ancelet, LEH's 2009 Humanist of the Year, is Professor Emeritus of Francophone Studies and a Center for Louisiana Studies Research Fellow at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, or ULL. He recently served as Poet Laureat de la Louisiane Francophone from 2018 to 2020. Marcia Godet was the founding director of the Ernest J. Gaines Center at ULL and is author of the award-winning book, Carville, Remembering Leprosy in America. Nick Spitzer, LEH's 2006 Humanist of the Year, is a professor of anthropology and American studies at Tulane University and host and producer of the nationally syndicated public radio show, American Roots. Moderating today's conversation is Robin Roberts, who co-authored Downtown Mardi Gras with Frank DeCaro and Leslie Wade. She's professor of English and Gender Studies at the University of Arkansas. She recently edited a special issue of Louisiana Folklore Miscellany dedicated to Frank's work. Welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us for today's program. Robin, I'm turning it over to you. Okay. Well, I am so pleased to um, have this opportunity to speak with such distinguished panelists about Frank DeCaro, who was not only himself a distinguished scholar and a great contributor and collector of information um, about the state of Louisiana, but also a lovely, warm, funny person who was a fantastic mentor to me and so many students and faculty at LSU for so many years. So um, I've we have a few photographs to kind of mark uh, aspects of Frank's career. And so I'm going to ask Claire if she would pull up the PowerPoint. And um, we'll start by looking at the first image. And my question for the panelists, and I would like um, maybe Barry could go first, uh, because that's uh, his <laughs> photograph. But of course, Marsha was instrumental in getting this photograph for this special is issue. Um, and of course, Nick has also participated in so many activities with Frank. And here we see Frank as the consummate participant observer. Uh, so um, Barry, <laughs> could you say something about Frank's influence and activities as a folklorist, maybe making reference to this very compelling image that you yeah, took? Yeah, he, he was not only a participant observer, he was a, a participant receiver. Uh, <laughs> in this uh, and. Uh, you know, he came out to uh, take a look at the country Mardi Gras uh, one year. Linda Day came out, I think, the same year. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he knew, obviously knew a lot about 
uh, Mardi Gras, especially in the New Orleans setting in Baton Rouge, Spanish town, and, and uh, he knew about uh, the country Mardi Gras, but he had never felt it. He had never, <laughs> it had never enveloped him in this way. And uh, I, I have to admit that um, I, what you're looking at, what happened to him there cost me 20 bucks. Uh, I was interested at the time in, in uh, giving him the full-blown experience of being handled by the women Mardi Gras in Timamu. And you know, this is, this is you know, uh, it was funny and it was, it was fun. Uh, but I, when those ladies took him down, his head banged the, the ground pretty hard. I heard it from where I was standing, taking this shot. He never flinched, complained. He knew he was in the moment. He dealt with it. And on the way back to the car after the visit, he said, Roseanne, give me some aspirin. My head hurts. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that it, it speaks to his commitment about being in the moment and being committed to what he was in, uh, uh, experiencing and involving, involved in. Uh, <clears throat> he was just an absolute uh, 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 ferocious field worker. He, he, he just was curious about everything. He was, and he noticed everything. He noticed uh, everything that was going on around him. So I was really keen to get his impressions on this Mardi Gras, talk to him about it later. And he had some really, really interesting commentary about what he saw uh, going on there. Well, I think Roseanne's forgiven you for putting her uh, <laughs> husband at risk because there's a large, there's an enlargement of this uh, photograph in uh, her apartment. So hey. I think you've been forgiven. Um, maybe um, Marcia, you would want to comment on um, this image or on Frank as a public folklorist because he's certainly very much in the public in this image. Oh, yes. And um, it, one of my the images, I think I agree with Barry that it just captures something about Frank. And in fact, when I had seen the image and knew about the whole episode, and uh, I asked Barry about it and he sent it to me. And along with that, and here this is pretty much a quote from Barry, um, he says, I think it captures a side of Frank that one could overlook if one were only considering his elegant scholarship and demeanor. But he had a playful side that could be downright quirky. And he didn't mind finding himself in his butt for the sake of tradition. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think, again, that captures Frank because he was certainly a, um, a totally dedicated field worker. I mean, that curiosity of just simply being involved with everything in Louisiana folklore, uh, from publishing you know, or editing the miscellany to doing scholarship and various things. Um, but he was also very much willing you know, to be right in the moment and to participate in something like this. And I, I think it's true that, um, you know, for those of us who knew him, um, in spite of that headache, I think he really enjoyed that experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're all certainly enjoying it years later. It is an image that's very powerful and very engaging. Uh, Barry, when I look at it, I feel like I'm there in the moment with Frank. And I'm wondering why I'm not trying to help him. I'm just looking, but uh, it's it's a great image. So you know, Nick, could you maybe comment on um, Frank as a public folklorist and a scholar, maybe taking a riff from this image or the next one we'll show, which is one you contributed? Sure, be happy to. Let's see what it's like coming up here. It should be Frank sitting on his Cadillac in front of the uh, Louisiana State Capitol. Uh, Let's see. Nope. Uh, there, that, that one there. Yeah, I took this photograph, 1982. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I had known Frank uh, really from the beginning when I arrived in uh, Baton Rouge to start working for the state as running the Louisiana Folklife Program. 
And uh, yeah, we were kind of really opposite in many, in many ways. I, it's funny, I hear Barry, I never would have used the term ferocious to describe anything about Frank, but I think metaphorically, it's actually true. <laughs> It, uh, because he really was a, a ferocious humorist and thinker, but very quiet in demeanor and elegant. And, uh, you know, Frank uh, came a little more from the literary side of folklore um, than I did. I come really more from the anthropological side of folklore. Um, and I, I didn't expect necessarily that Frank and I would become great allies, but, um, you know, th there was at LSU this sort of great mingling. Uh, on one side, you have the uh, anthropology department of Fred Niffen, who was, you know, uh, Milton Newton and later Jay Edwards. And uh, on the English department side, you, you know, you have the legacy of uh, Lewis Simpson and Robert Penn Warren. And I, I realize we're dealing with the manly men here, but um, the, the question was, how does one reconcile um, the, the worlds of anthropology and, and literature? And I think folklore is one of the great answers. Folklore always had anthropologists involved, whether, you know, as well as literary scholars and, and founders of the Louisiana Folklore Society. Uh, you know, include Alsay Fortier, but also include, uh, you know, Boaz and Daniel Brenton. And so this commingling of the world of ethnography and observation and the world of, of literary study and the text and antiquities really came together at LSU. And I think I came to meeting Frank feeling that I really needed help uh, in Baton Rouge. Uh, I'm not a native Louisianian. Uh, I did find help at UL, uh, you know, with Marsha and Barry and Louisiana Tech with Susan Roach and, and, and uh, Don Hatley and, and uh, um, Pete Gregory up at uh, Northeastern, um, as well as people at uh, UNO, uh, Joe Guillot, Martha Ward come to mind. So you're always looking for colleagues, but LSU was the home team and, and Frank was there. But Frank didn't seem like an LSU good old boy at all to me. I had a stereotype, you know, being an Eastern of what LSU was. Um, and uh, hey, now my son will be attending there in, uh, in the fall in, in design, uh, art and design, and he's a painter and a designer. But I learned a lot about uh, the meaning of LSU and Louisiana life from Frank, and, and I was able to really understand better uh, how we should look at, at folklore as a public process. And, you know, Frank and I came from, you know, me a little more on the public side, event oriented performance oriented, recordings, documentary. He came a bit more from the side of academic scholarship the text, books are well considered. But I, I think we got along extremely well. And I, I should say we, uh, in, inclusive of Roseanne, um, because they all worked with me uh, on many cases and helped me understand how to work with people and who to work with. And by 1982, when this picture was taken, uh, we'd been at it a few years with conferences and programs and events. Uh, and we had started this Louisiana Folk Life Commission feeling it was the way to politically deal uh, with the state we were in, literally, uh, and I guess uh, metaphorically. And, uh, you know, I used to kid Frank a lot about his look. I mean, he always wore the little, you know, uh, blue jackets and, you know, the ascot or the p matching pocket hanky and loafers and everything. And <laughs> I had to kid him about that. Uh, you know, and I, and I was more the blue jeans and, you know, muddy boots kind of guy. Let's go to the Cajun dance. Let's run around the Delta. Let's do this. Let's do that. Um, but I think we got along very well as a meeting of the minds and maybe because both of us were outlanders, but both of us had a deep, uh, I think, growing relationship um, to various aspects of Louisiana culture. And, you know, both of us felt strongly that we needed to figure out ways in public that we could represent Louisiana culture, working with the colleagues I mentioned and working with all the tremendous culture bearers in the state. And, you know, I just saw Frank grow through that. And I grew through working with Frank and Roseanne. And uh, this was just a happy day where, <laughs> I mean, he, he told me he'd gotten his Cadillac and I'm going, Frank, what, what about you? Where's, what are your image, man? <laughs> you know? He said, oh, you know, everyone else has got one. I, got, I should have one too. I'm the head of the com commission now, you know? <laughs> so, so it was all very funny in that moment, but that's how this picture came to be. And uh, I, we can talk more about Frank and the program later, but the, the, that's the origin of the photograph, that triumphant moment for the Folk Life Commission and for Frank sitting on the hood there. Well, it's a wonderful photograph and I'm so uh, happy to have it. And it, I already know from hearing from participants in this uh, webinar that they really enjoyed seeing this. I think a lot of people had not seen this or seen it recently. Claire, could I ask you to go back to the previous slide 
which is Frank with Carolyn Ware, because um, uh -huh. Nick actually brings up a really important aspect of Frank and Roseanne's work in that they were wonderful mentors and colleagues. And so here is uh, Frank celebrating Mardi Gras. I'm not sure which parade it was with Carolyn Ware. And uh, I'll just say that uh, Frank and Roseanne were wonderful mentors and colleagues uh, to, for me and my husband. And I know that they've helped really generations of scholars in Louisiana. So um, uh, Barry, is there anything you'd want to say about that? And then maybe we could go to Marsha and Nick to, if there's anything you'd like to add, Nick, to the idea of how they developed and grew the study of Louisiana folk. Well, once again, I think uh, uh, it's based on, it was based on that, that endless curiosity. Uh, as Nick pointed out, he came to the study of folklore I guess more through the, the academic and, and literary side, but uh, he was constantly looking around and, and, and seeing what was what and, and making sense of it. Uh, he, was, he, he, was, he was used to reading, reading folklore, but he would read, he could read folklore in the street as well as in a book. Uh, and he was really good at it. And he was also one of the most generous colleagues uh, I've ever encountered. He didn't jealously guard uh, any subject he was teaching. Like, you know, the, the, the recent book that just came out on downtown Mardi Gras is a great example of him, you know, just happily, willingly sharing um, what he's thinking about and what he's doing uh, with colleagues around him. Uh, I have to, you know, I'd like to just add one more, one more note about that shot of him getting taken down by the women. You know, somebody said it, it, it captured something about Frank. It also captured Frank, <laughs> it very literally, kind of literally. Uh, but those were women. Those, that was the women's uh, run in Timamu. And, uh, you know, I think if you look at the people he worked with, he worked with Nick and me and other, but he also worked with a lot of women folklorists when, um, uh, you know, it was important to include all the voices to all the perspectives and and you know not not everybody was paying attention to what women were seeing uh i remember working with carolyn uh, uh out on the out in the mardi gras fields and 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 she would come back and we would talk about what we had seen what we had shot what we had photographed and i noticed that she was noticing remarkably different things different things that were different from what we were noticing because we were all you know, seeing things from our perspective. And I was telling Marcia just the other day, we were talking about this conversation. I think Frank DeCaro may have been the first male feminist that I knew personally. Uh, and that perspective he had wasn't based on any kind of political uh, statement or, or feeling. It was based on genuine curiosity and a sense of, uh, morality, I guess, uh, to make sure that he, he paid attention to everything, uh, that nothing was getting left out. Um, his work, uh, you know, on New Orleans post Katrina was, you know, th that was so evident in that work. Uh, what, what he, what all of y'all were noticing in the revival of these are the, the invention of these new Mardi Gras in downtown. Again, he was reading New Orleans like a book. He was good at it. And he was inclusive, embracing, uh, and, and remarkably collaborative. Marcia, maybe yeah. you'd like to springboard off that comment. And yeah, uh, but first to, to pick up on what Barry said about his uh, work with you know, women's folklore and feminist folklore. One of his early books, um, was a you know, bibliography of um, women's folklore. Um, and that was a remarkable work. And again, that curiosity that he you know, saw the, the value of sort of this inclusiveness and looking at folklore from many, many different um, you know, angles. And, uh, and especially that kind of comprehensive thing what always amazed me about Frank is that uh, he was 
just a meticulous scholar that he could do, he did two books you know, of huge bibliographies and annotated them. Uh, but he also did field work. And it seems that, you know, whatever interest he had, he followed it up. Um, and in going over some, you know, all of his scholarship, it occurred to me that, you know, probably the only thing that he had not published on in folklore studies was music. Um, and then, you know, to show how he could, could combine that sort of uh, literary and um, anthropological or you know, folkloric perspective in the issue with that picture on the cover, um, his short story on Buddy Bowden, it's you know, what Buddy Bowden said. So obviously, even though I, I don't think, maybe wrong, but I don't think he's published in music, he was certainly interested in musicians and especially Louisiana's you know, sort of history of, of folk and traditional music. But coming back to him as a mentor, um, Frank and I were almost exactly the same age. In fact, I think I like two weeks older than he is. And, but he came to folklore much earlier than I did. And so when I was just getting into it, he was already established at LSU. And I came to it from um, you know, a literary perspective too. And it always amazed me how generous he was. I mean, I wasn't even at the same university. And, you know, we've uh, at times kidded about the fact that there are really big rivalries between UL Lafayette and LSU. And yet, especially the folklorists, and including Roseanne and the others there, uh, they were so generous and open to collaborative things with UL in a way that I, I didn't see that in many other disciplines. Um, and I, I think basically that they were so generous and, um, you know, when you're just getting started to have someone from another university you know, being that supportive and encouraging. And we share, you know, that interest in folklore and literature, and especially Louisiana folklore and literature. Also, one of the things that, you know, uh, unless you've read Frank's wonderful book on uh, uh, stories of our lives, you know, you might I know that he actually <laughs> came to folklore, not only from a literary background, but he had worked uh, for two, two years in New York City as a, a social worker. And amazingly, and then he went into graduate school in, in folklore. And I had that same background, you know, literature, I worked as a social worker, and we both then went into folklore. And I think, again, that interest in stories, uh, in hearing about people's lives was another thing. He was so good at listening. And you know, for someone in a listening discipline, we do that so much. Um, he was so good in listening to other people's stories. And that was sort of uh, a, a, a way of looking at how to do things for me. Well, that's, uh, I, I agree. And I think that's a very eloquent description of Frank as a listener. He was so productive, as you um, note in your article, uh, in the uh, LFM, he published 14 books, but somehow he also found time to mentor and listen and create strong relationships with people. So I uh, thank you for that, uh, Marcia. Nick, do you want to add anything before we move on to talking about uh, more specifically some of his books and his uh, mm -hmm. articles? Yeah, maybe I can bridge to some of that. <clears throat> First, I, I want to say something about uh, social work. Um, and how it relates to Frank's uh, perspective. Because I, I think one of the key realities um, for people working in public agencies and doing public folklore <clears throat> is that, especially if you work for a state or a city or the federal government, <clears throat> you, you have to, I think, uh, intuitively and, some and consciously and 
finally, I think in terms of uh, uh, you, you know your own uh, intellectual worldview, you end up feeling very strongly that everybody you're working with is a citizen and that some citizens are especially important as culture bearers uh, within their own groups and that you have a responsibility to help the citizenry uh, within which you are uh, employed um, to best realize their sense of the cultural past. Yes, the past. A lot of people want to know about the past. Folklorists want to know about it. Ethnographers want to know about it. You want to know from the present, the fieldwork, what's going on. And then it seems to me that the larger conversation that emerges is a public conversation about what the future might be for people. You know, everybody's kind of notion of a promised land or a more perfect union. And I think Frank was a wonderful person to have that conversation with. And uh, with regard to music, it emerged early um, because we started a Baton Rouge Blues Festival. And, you know, I'd come from Austin. Baton Rouge was, was very segregated and in many ways still is. Austin was as well to some degree, but nothing like I'd ever experienced as in Baton Rouge. And so when we started the Blues Festival, something Frank and I talked over, we dealt with the local arts council, especially the blues people and their families and getting out in public. And there were some people at LSU who objected to it, they referred to the music as noise. And Frank, Frank countered that with them. I just said, Frank, push back on those guys. And, you know, we, he, you know, we kind of like, oh, what do you expect, you know? But we got it out there and got it moving. And little by little, the Blues Festival with its Gospel Sundays took over and became really an important event for Baton Rouge, a city that really struggles, I think, with being more than the state capital and the major universities and an oil town. And, you know, it doesn't have that sort of, you know, swagger of French Louisiana and Lafayette or, or the soul of the Creole Caribbean New Orleans or, or, or even some of the ruralities of upstate uh, Anglo Afro Louisiana. So I think he was very, he had that sense of citizenry uh, and culture bears, but he also knew when to push back and say, no, you, you can't be saying that. And let's move forward on these things. And so, you know, I just saw him evolving in that public role more and more and more. And the good thing about it is it took, takes the heat off someone like me <laughs> to have other people saying things so I don't have to do it all the time. And so, so I really, really appreciated that. And I'll just segue to one thing in the, in the publications that I think relates to this. You know, I, I joke sometimes, you know, that the, the, the literature world, you know, doesn't do ethnography. And the ethnography world doesn't always get the text uh, or the narrative or the ritual right or deal with it even in today's postmodern world. But photography that Frank wrote about eloquently shares with ethnography the graph, graphic aspect, the documentary aspect. And I think when he did that book in particular, and I love all the other books for different reasons, he, he was able to um, give an intellectual history of photography but also produce a volume with all those photographs that showed the visions of people and about people in a way that many, many people could understand, uh, read the photography as it were, as well as the text. And to me, that is his greatest single public folklore book uh, because it was able to reach across and become special and, and in a sense use the past and the present and the personalities and visions involved to talk about what does it mean to be a citizen uh, folklorist concerned about the populace and, and you know what is the future when you look at the past up to the present and, that, and that's why I particularly love that and some of you know that I told him I said that it, it showed that Frank was great in the text and uh, we did that in a Louisiana Folklore Society meeting <laughs> he, he, he joked about that for another 30 years <laughs> and I think he was you know it was a happy moment because it was that was Frank kind of being his coming out as it were as a major figure in public folklore. It's a book I've used in courses and I know a lot of other people have as well because of that. Well, and I think this book also, uh, Marcia, is another instance of Frank's attention to music, which yes. is muted somewhat because it's mediated through folklore, but there are a lot of amazing photographs of musicians in this yes. book. Mm -hmm. And um, as I said, uh, a moment ago, Frank has 14 books, and I couldn't put slides of all of them, but I'm glad that, Nick, you agree this was this is one of his most important books. And also, he had a, a fabulous exhibit, so he reached people who are not maybe so attuned to books through uh, an exhibit that many uh, tourists and many locals saw um, in, in New Orleans. And I guess the only thing I'd be interested in as we continue to look at some slides about his book, I'm very fond of Louisiana Sojourns, which 
uh, he did with Roseanne Jordan. And, uh, you know, I think that is a great example of public outreach folklore that is still used today. And Frank, again, was ahead of the time because, you know, he paid attention to the sites of Solomon Northrop, which now, you know, 15 years later, we now have some signage about. But when Frank was researching it, nobody else was really paying attention and publishing about it. So maybe we could go back in order again. And Barry, is there anything you want to say about any particular of, of Frank's, any specific books or um, the two slides we've just seen? Oh. Uh, maybe more generally, the, the, the something that Nick was alluding to, his ability to just take on absolutely anything. He, he, he was curious about everything. And his ponderings about, uh, about folklore and folk life, uh, the stuff that he ended up looking at and listening to and studying, uh, those, weren't, those weren't, you know, intellectual exercises for him. They were, um, they were projects uh, through which he was genuinely trying to communicate what what he was understanding, what he saw, what he uh, you know came to came to know about uh, life around him. He you know all of his books were beautiful uh, attempts to communicate to to uh, a lot of audiences at a lot of levels. You know the fact that, that you know there was a great photographic exhi exhibition that accompanied uh, the the, pho the, pho the um, folk life photography book. Um, it, he and and you know maybe maybe some of that came out of uh, the collaborations he was having that with Nick and and the the Louisiana Folk Life Commission. Uh, but I, I think it was in him anyway. I, I think it was in him anyway. And he, you know this 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 amazing ability to, to look at just, and it, and it ended up not being random. It wasn't just willy nilly. It, it, it covered a lot of ground, but it covered a lot of ground in a very mindful, you know, thoughtful, uh, considerate way. Um, I mean, it, it, the one, the book that, that really struck me uh, was the storytelling book and his ability to take a look at, uh, how stories are told, what they mean, uh, how they, how seemingly, you know, minor little stories can tell us so much about who we are and how we interact in our relationships, and and his his willingness to to you know to go into how some of his own personal stories for that book was pretty pretty courageous and 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 effective uh, at that. Um, and we'll uh, talk maybe in a second more about his memoir. But Marcia, do you want to uh, say anything about a favorite book or any of the book slides we've just shown covers that we? Yeah. Um, it, it, again, it's 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 hard to uh, sort of say what's my favorite book. I think it's the one I'm looking at at the time um, because you know I'm always amazed at Louisiana Sojourns because. This is a 900 page book mm. that just cover, covers travelers' tales where people who came to Louisiana, it, it includes the writers like Faulkner and well, Walker Percy lived here, but still, you know, he has things from them. And then he has, um, you know, from you know, 19th century travelers and, uh, the scope of that and just having to be aware of all of the people who traveled through Louisiana. And again, he was a little bit ahead of his time of the, you know, the trend because a little bit after that, then travelers tales, travelers literature became a huge thing uh, in uh, narrative and literary studies. Um, so uh, again, and the other thing I love about this book is uh, his the updates after every section? He goes back and sort of updates what's in Louisiana, and along with with Roseanne, of course, because uh, they both edited it. But adding to that in that knowledge, and always pointing out sort of the uh, you know the quirky things, the humorous things that he saw in it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Um, 
I think the book that I go back to and I've read several times is probably his memoir, um, you know, Stories of Our Lives. Uh, and again, I, there's a wonderful quote, uh, I don't know if you've seen that, by Eric Mai Garcia and Solimor Otero on the IU website where they did a tribute to Frank. And um, I have it here. They say <clears throat> Frank DeCaro was a genuinely kind person who showed us how to reach the better parts of ourselves through stories. And that's a really interesting thing about stories of our lives and that intersection of memory, history, and narrative that um, I, I think his observations about how those intersect and how we come up, up with the stories and always his interest in the aesthetic use of language. That sort of uh, weaves together some strands that we've been talking about. Frank as a mentor, because he was uh, colleagues of Sully and Eric, they yes. were at LSU mm -hmm. for many years. And they also both wrote articles uh, in the LFM, which is a tribute to him, showing through their scholarship how he influenced uh, their research. And so his work lives on in another generation of younger scholars. So thank you for bringing up that uh, quotation and that connection, Marcia. I think that's very, um, very important, very key to understanding Frank's many, many contributions. Um, Nick, do you want to add anything? Uh, do you want to address the gauntlet I threw down that Louisiana Sojourns is also a very important book? Or do you want to say anything about the memoir before we move on? Well, I, you know, I, I'm completely agreeing about Louisiana Sojourns. Um, to me, it is, uh, you know, a series of, in, in a sense, putting people in, in places through words um, and selective use of narratives and you know diaries and travelers accounts and reviews and all those things. And yeah, and it also suits the world of you know, the commerce of Louisiana, which is so based on visitors now and was increasingly based on visitors when this was put out. But this gives people a chance to quickly go into great depth and breadth. I mean, it's a gigantic work. And uh, you know, I just leave it by my bedside and every so often read a, an entry I haven't read. No, I, I think it's very much in line with the photography book, um, it, but it uses text to take you uh, visually and, and in memory and in your mind to those places. And I think it's fine. I'll, I'll mention one other thing about his writing. Uh, when, he, when he finally starts tackling the history of folklore scholarship in Louisiana, and of course, it's all bound up in class and race, and then the history of uh, you know, post-Civil War realities and, and tragedies, um, you know, he takes you to these meetings of the scholars and um, amateur and professional. And, uh, you know, you, you hear a, a subtexts in what people are saying uh, that are troubling in some cases. And you hear some voices that are more tolerant and enlightened towards questions of race. Um, but, but the thing I like about what everything Frank does, he, he, he explicates, uh, he helps interpret but he does not castigate. In other words, he leaves it to readers and viewers to draw their own conclusions. And I'm a firm believer that the only way you change people's minds in our turbulent society is by touching their affect. And I think this stuff touches people's affect. Photography more instantly and readily because people like to look at pictures. Uh, you don't have to be able to read that well to look at pictures. But Louisiana Sojourns gives you an easy access to an enormous amount of depth and breadth and his summaries of going in a sense into the profession that he was part of in Louisiana and saw himself as a continuation of in a lot of ways. That presents challenges. And I really like the way he and Roseanne uh, together actually worked on one essay that addresses who was there, what they said, what it might have meant. And then you can go from there and come to your conclusions rather than assuming everybody is somehow all the same and everything in that particular era. And I mean, I think that's great scholarship and great public discourse. Another aspect of uh, Frank's work, and Claire, if you could move to the next slide. Um, we've already been talking about his memoir. Uh, Frank also had a degree in creative writing. He, and uh, I think he is a one of the best scholarly writers I know in, 
in part because of his attention to language from kind of a creative um, perspective. So um, actually, Claire, if you could go, I think back, I forget my order now. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is the collection that he edited. So Frank not only published his own uh, memoir, nonfiction writing, and we published one of his short stories in the LFM issue dedicated to him, but he also edited this collection, which contains uh, poetry by Frank and also um, uh, poetry by Roseanne. And so uh, maybe uh, if uh, each of you would be willing to say a little something about Frank as a stylist or about the influence of creative writing or the way that he wrote. Um, I think we've kind of mentioned this obliquely, but maybe address it more directly if, if you feel so inclined. Barry, would, would you like? Well, you know, the word that comes to mind immediately is elegance. He was just such an elegant writer. He uh, talk about a stylist, you know, even 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 in an email, <laughs> you know, <laughs> even an email, it sounded elegant. So imagine when he was really paying hard attention to it in something uh, like a scholarly article or or a piece of uh, creative work. It was it was it was kind of stunning to see stunning to read and 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 kind of inhibiting <laughs> a bit um struck me a little bit when you you know you read frank's scholarship uh uh in any of his writings really it reminded me of uh, something i felt when uh, <clears throat> uh i was working on uh the uh makers of cajun creole music book that university of texas press published and had sent it to Nick and Nick said, you know, something to the effect of why are you holding back? <laughs> why don't you, why don't you dig in, uh, let yourself go. And right at the same time, uh, Henry Glassie uh, uh, published um, text from the North. And when I read the introduction to that, I thought, oh, oh, we can let ourselves go. And when I read Frank, uh, some of Frank's work uh, early on, I said, oh, wait, it can be beautiful. It doesn't have to be just right and correct and accurate. It could be beautiful as well. Uh, you know, he made it beautiful, made it um, not just readable, but it kind of inspiring. Yes, uh, thank you, Barry. I think that's very true. And he really challenges anyone who reads his work to write better. And I know he always uh, helped and encouraged me to do that. Marsha, do you want to add anything uh, about Frank's style? Uh, let's see. I, I do want to just mention that uh, this the folklore muse was, so, I think, was sort of the result of um, the creative folklore and creative writing section. And many of the people who contributed uh, to this book um, got together uh, to do a, a session at the American Folklore Society, I think the year after it was, or the year that it was published. And it was a session in honor of Frank. And part of that was sort of the recognition of his role in encouraging that sort of, um, what, intersection of folklorists, you know, in, on the one hand, the very scholarly things, um, and on the other hand, the more creative things. And I think that, uh, especially for, for those who have that kind of creative talent, you know, if they appreciated greatly his uh, efforts to encourage that and to see it as a positive thing. Sometimes in you know, academic departments, uh, that's not valued as much. That is, you know, the, the strictly academic writing that only probably your colleagues are going to read uh, is, has been valued in the past. Uh, but I think with Frank, you know, I see that in certainly the folklore news of the very creative side, also in the photography book, and in Louisiana Sojourns. I mean, these were books that were the equivalent, you know, of trade writing, that they had a much wider audience. And 
I think that might be reflective also of his, you know, interest in public folklore. That you know, what we do, um, if it has any importance, we sh it should certainly be accessible to the wider audience, to the people. Not only you know, reading to each other in the academic field. Um, and Frank had a great appreciation for that. And I think you can see that in his books, that he was certainly capable. I mean, he was a brilliant theorist. Um, we see this in his book on uh, the book that he and Roseanne did on uh, folklore and literature. But he also you know, saw that uh, need to connect with the wider audience. That is, if our work has value, then certainly it should be accessible um, to the much wider audience, to the people who aren't only academic or public folklorists. Well, we are, don't have too much more time because we want to let participants uh, ask questions. So Claire, if you could just go through the next slides somewhat slowly, because it's so important in remembering Frank DeCaro to acknowledge uh, Roseanne Jordan's contributions, mm -hmm. and, which have been acknowledged by other entities. Uh, they have been honored. And the next slide of the cartoon of the two of them is one of my favorites. Um, Claire could, yes. And so there are Frank and Roseanne caricatured, but recognizably themselves studying the world, which is something that all of you have commented on with the microscope and the earth there as all objects worthy of study. And um, uh, maybe the next slide. Um, here is a photograph uh, when they were starting out as folklorists. Um, uh, I think that expresses their personality and their relationship uh, very well. And um, maybe just extremely briefly, if everybody could just say something about the collaborative work, how Frank and Roseanne worked as a team in publishing books, doing research, making presentations. Barry, do you want to go first? You no, know, the, the best you know, the, uh, measure of that was to just to watch them interact when, they, when, an, when an idea hit or when something came up. And they were they would just check with each other. <laughs> it was like bouncing. It was it was like it was electric. And uh, actually, uh, Nick does a great impression of Frank uh, as an idea was coming, and he would turn to Roseanne and say, "Nick, unmute. Nick, unmute." Sorry about that. I was trying to unmute. Uh, <laughs> geez, I don't think I can do the Vegas version of this, but he, he would just always go, oh, yeah, hmm, sure, hmm, yeah, kind of, but it was always a kind of an affirmative thing. And, you know, he and Roseanne would laugh and we'd, we'd talk about serious subjects, and uh, but we'd often fall more into laughter. And I think his closing line was also, also something that was in my article was, um, yeah, you said it. <laughs> and uh, it sounded almost Brooklyn, Brooklyn like. But it was a way of agreeing, or, but not necessarily agreeing on all the fine points of things. And, you know, uh, I think th that's something to say about Frank when I joke about him being great in the text. He was great in context. He, he was so fun to get and being with Roseanne together, whether you're looking at their folk art collection or hearing their travel tales, um, you, you know, you, there's a, they had a performative side uh, that you <laughs> might not have expected uh, from them. And, and I always cherish that, whether we were at parties or on the road together somewhere that there was this kind of, uh, you know, good, good uh, jive that was always kind of going on and humor at the absurdity of many of the situations uh, we saw or found ourselves in, you know, as well as the serious things, the ability to reflect on them. And I, I think conversation uh, with both of them is something in my, in my memory, I, I truly cherish because I, I got a lot from it. Marcia, can you just make a quick closing comment about Frank and Roseanne? Yeah, uh, like Barry and Nick, I, you know, my memories of Frank and Roseanne together. And I remember, you know, meeting them, I guess that was in uh, around 1980. Uh, and always that people I think have commented on them that not only wonderful mentors, but also 
people who welcomed you into their home. I mean, so many of us who know them remember, you know, their parties or remember um, how encouraging they were in so many ways. And um, for me, even, you know, I can remember one time when uh, we were at a meeting in Baton Rouge and I got sick. And Frankie and Roseanne, one of them drove my car to their house and then took care of me until I was, you know, well enough to leave. But again, not only that uh, collaboration on their scholarship, but that they were just, um, I, they were so good together that they seemed to just, you know, their thoughts or thinkings, what to do in a situation just seem to kind of melt together. And you know, um, I, I'm not doing a good job of describing it, but they were sort of one of those couples that you always thought of them together. Yeah. Well, I think that was very eloquent, Marcia. Thank you very much. So Claire, could we have the last slide, please? So at this point, um, I think uh -huh. we're going to turn it over to the audience who may have questions for individual panelists or, um, and I think uh, Aaron explained that the participants can put questions in the Q&A on the bottom of the screen. And I, I see there's one already, let's see. Okay, here's a question and maybe each of you can answer it quickly. How would Frank advise us to best appreciate folklore? What should we have in mind when we encounter or read about it? So kind of a question about Frank's um, approach to folklore and how he would teach it maybe. Barry? Uh, I think he would uh, advise us to uh, be mindful of the value and the importance of it to people who are practicing it. And it came up in a couple of discussions earlier about how, how he wrote about it. He wrote about it in a very scholarly, elegant, and in, you know, in intellectually sound way, but not in an obtuse way. Not where he, he, he was always interested in communicating back to the people that he studied. And he felt like, you know, what, why, would, why would we leave them out? And uh, I think he would, he would advise us to uh, to remember, to remember the value uh, and the dignity of the people that we're studying. Thank you, Marcia. Did you want to answer that? And, and I, yeah, I, I agree with Barry completely. Um, that that interest in things folkloric or anything that his study of narrative. I think he was very interested in people and that really ability to um, do the meet people and to get them to talk about the things that were important. And we haven't talked very much about his work with Mardi Gras, um, but I, I think there, uh, you know, that ability to see those things in Mardi Gras that perhaps those of us who had been here all along didn't see as well, that he was very good at doing that. Nick? Well, the fact that he did a book on Mardi Gras, by the way, uh, it, the last book uh, had to do with how Mardi Gras was rebounding and, and surviving. And and in re and sort of re inventing new uh, uh, iterations of itself uh, is a great example of how he never stopped paying attention to what was going on around him. He thought about folklore in real time, and mm -hmm. you know the irony. There's a kind of a sad irony uh, that he passed away from something that he would have studied yes. if mm -hmm. he had lived. I mean, yeah. this COVID, this COVID thing, this this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, quarantine issue and all of that. I mean, you know, I'm, I, I, I predict that if, if Frank DeCaro had not died of COVID, he would have studied the effects of COVID on yeah. us as a society. Yeah, just as he studied the, we haven't mentioned his study of legends, but that, that was a big 
uh, again, interest in things that he studied. And he studied the legends about Katrina mm -hmm. and sort of helped us to interpret what was going on. And I agreed that he would have also studied uh, legends about COVID. Nick, do you want to add to the answer? Yeah, that? I mean, I, I think one of the great things about Frank um, was that he never forgot that he was culturally situated by who he was and who he'd been, where he came from, uh, and that everybody is culturally situated. And so when we would have uh, engagements with Louisiana legislators, you know, he was asking them about where they came from and their visions and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, I, I think in a human discourse, I think the outsider can make a contribution as, as Marcia says, and notice things that people who are native practitioners don't notice. And, and likewise, um, native folks have interior knowledge that they grew up with that can be explicated when asked and, and made into festivals or books or careers or whatever. And so in a sense, we need both kinds of people. Uh, and that's the ultimate kind of a humanist and humanity scholar, I think that that Frank was, that he was able to, to see those things and, and choose subjects that he thought were important and write eloquently about them. And, and uh, you know, that, that means that everybody has a narrative, everybody has an identity, everybody hopefully is capable of negotiating the identity and doing something of value across all the kinds of possible lines. And in Louisiana, there were a lot of people in Baton Rouge and the state government who looked down on local culture because they thought they transcended it when they went off to LSU or some other place to become educated people. And I think having somebody as eloquent and capable and intelligent as Frank, being there present, obviously interested an outsider sort of was another demonstration of this is more important than just you and me, but you and me are involved in this discussion, so let's have it. And, and I, I just think he was so gracious with those kinds of encounters um, it was much better than me. <laughs> uh, and so, so it's really, really great to have that, that intelligence of, of, and awareness of being culturally situated yourself as well as with others. Well, thank you, Nick. You've answered a question that came up is how important was his outsider's perspective? And there are two other related questions, which may be Barry, Marcia, and Nick, you could answer in order. Um, I particularly appreciate Frank and Roseanne's dedication to and influence on the Louisiana Folklore Society. Could you address that? And then relatedly, Nick, can you speak on Frank's role in the development of the 1985 Louisiana Folk Life book? <laughs> so two big questions. Barry, you want to go first? Well, I, uh, how, uh, his effect on the Louisiana Folklore Society, I would expand that. Uh, to his effect on uh, the American Folklore Society and the, and the Folklore Fellows and, and mm -hmm. just every organization, the, the Louisiana Folklife Commission, every organization that he was a part of, uh, the thing that struck me was, and Nick just alluded to this, he, w he never lost his cool. He, 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 he had a, an amazing way of keeping his eye on the issue, on the problem, on, on the thing at hand but I never saw him riled. I, what I saw always in him was, uh, okay, how could we solve this? How could we, what can we do with this? You know, I, I never saw him uh, out of kilter. Uh, <laughs> this is the most amazing social and, and intellectual balance uh, mm. that I, I, I don't know, I haven't seen that often. I mean, you know, uh, I'm not. I won't speak for Marsha. She has that. She has some. A lot of the same thing. Nick and I, uh, if if he'll admit it, have both been a bit, you know, <laughs> enthusiastic, shall we say, uh, in our interactions <laughs> with. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> in our interactions with uh, with opposition or, or or you know, recalcitrant forces, but and Frank was never. He never lost sight of what needed to happen, but. He also had this um, this elegant, gentle way of dealing with it. It was astonishing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barry. Marcia? Yeah, uh, uh, just coming back to the Louisiana Folklore Society, I think that um, I would credit Frank with really uh, being the one who transitioned Louisiana Folklore Miscellany uh, from something that was, you know, 
a nice little publication <laughs> to what I think is now, you know, a really important, both scholarly and um, you know, appeal to the public type of uh, annual publication. And when he became editor, he was really the one who uh, looked at, you know, what this needed to be, redesigned it, and also made sure that it was an annual publication. It wasn't just, you know, when we got around to doing it. Um, but I, I also, and I'm working with, with Frank and his support, he and Roseanne, until the, the last few years, um, always attended Louisiana Folklore Society. And then I worked really, I, probably most closely with Frank, with the American Folk Law Society Fellows. And uh, again, that model of fairness and you know, how we should conduct this, his ideas about um, you know, inclusivity, that we needed to expand it, that we needed to, to, to have a larger view about what the purpose of what we were doing there. And again, agree with Barry that um, some of the meetings would uh, get very uh, enthusiastic, many strong feelings and ideas. And I learned from him since I followed him as president of the fellows that that balance that evenness, you know, that he could listen to people speak. And then his response was always, you know, to, to hear someone else. He didn't get riled by those kinds of things and kept he, that balance. And he could, he could even listen to someone shouting yes. and hear what was good in it, what was valuable in it. Um, and I, I've never, ever, heard Frank, you know, I mean, he probably he could have some really wonderful zingers, but not <laughs> ever to put someone down. You know, they were always <laughs> never any kind of malicious uh, statement. Okay. Nick? Well, uh, regarding the, uh, the Louisiana Folk Life, A Guide to the State, it, it was finally published in 1985, and the year that I, I left to go to the Smithsonian, uh, Frank was and Roseanne were both incredibly helpful. And Frank did do um, what I saw as the first kind of intellectual history uh, of folklore study and practice in Louisiana for that book and did a great job with it. <clears throat> and then he collaborated with myself, uh, Roseanne and Susan Roach, who I think is probably listening to this uh, in, in Ruston, um, on a, a, a segment on an, an essay on traditional crafts. And I think we all needed to have a, a variety of people working on it because how could you cover the whole state and, and know the crafts? And even then we, it was just kind of an overview, but, but it was a good overview. And, and Frank and Roseanne both uh, read chapters and helped editorially um, to make that book happen. And so, so that was great. And while we're talking about publications, um, I wanna thank uh, Robin Roberts, who's been hosting here um, for editing uh, the issue on Frank that began with the wonderful photograph of him being dra dragged by the uh, women's Mardi Gras uh, in the Southwest Louisiana, uh, because it's a great mingling of personal uh, scholarly um, and other kinds of narratives and analysis from a wide range of people. And uh, I think anybody that's looking at this should join the Louisiana Folklore Society and at minimum get a copy of the uh, issue devoted to uh, the work of, of uh, Frank DeCaro. So thank you, Robin. Well, um, before we close, I do think that Roseanne is um, a participant. She's watching, we can't see her, but I would just like to uh, add also, um, Roseanne, I know how much you miss Frank. I hope that you realize how much he's meant to so many of the rest of us and what a wonderful con contribution both of you have made to the state, to the community and to the people who love both of you very much. So if anyone else wants to uh, say anything in closing, I think uh, Aaron will come back in a minute, but uh, if any of the other panelists wanna make a shout out to Roseanne or uh, have another comment about Frank, whose career and life and personality 
we can't do justice to in such a short time, but we have done our best. Mm -hmm. I would like to say to Roseanne, thank you for sharing him with us. Uh, we realized we put we realized we put a lot of uh, mans on that, but uh, it was very generous of you to share it with. And and thank you for being there too. Uh, I think uh, I think what came out of uh, that was uh, sounded a lot better in stereo. <laughs> I would just like to thank everybody on the panel for sharing the memories of Frank. And just to thank you, Roseanne, yes, we, we had a lot of really great times together and, and so many good exchanges. And, you know, we, we all had trials and tribulations and we helped each other. And, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm just so pleased by recognizing Frank by the LEH and uh, the miscellany and, the, and this conversation and, and hope that you're doing well and hope to see you one day soon. Thanks, Marcia. Yeah. Roseanne, to add to that, yeah. Um, so we know how much you love Frank, but you know, all of us uh, had that, had a love for Frank. He was someone that was greatly admired in a way that, you know, not very many people are. And um, again, thank you for sharing him with us. And thank you too, to the LEH for honoring Frank's many works and um to the person who nominated him who's on the panel marcia that it's a lot of work to nominate someone but i i hope your task was made easy by his uh you know long cv that had so many uh, wonderful contributions and i see erin is back so i will turn it back over to her thank you so much robin and to you barry nick and marcia this was a great conversation and i truly wish i had known frank um, I did not know him. I know his work, but you have really paid great homage to him today. So thank you so much for joining us and participating in Bright Lights Online in a conversation meant to remember lifetime contributions of the humanities to the Humanities Awardee Frank DeCaro. We hope you'll join us again next Friday for our final Bright Lights Online conversation of the year with our Light Up for Literacy awardee, Pat Austin, who spent nearly a half a century instilling a love of reading in children and teachers. You can register for that program at leh.org. Thanks everybody and have a great weekend. <laughs>